Okay, so next, upset square corners. Upset square corners can be a little bit challenging. I will try to make them so they are not upsetting. Okay, so level two requires two types of square corners. I took this right off the website. I'm going to digest what that says. It says that you need to make two square corners. The first one is made by bending the bar and then upsetting material into the corner. Uh, when you do it that way, you have a square on the inside interior dimension and you have a square corner on the outside. The second method is where you upset the bar first in the area where the corner is going to go uh, and then bend the bar and then do basically the same procedure to um, with your hammer to upset material into the corner. This creates a really dramatic radius or gusset on the interior part of the corner and a square on the outside. So I'm gonna be going through how to forge each of these. Just as an aside, there are other ways to make square corners, uh, but I'm sticking to what the uh, requirements are for the level two. Okay, so I'm going to start with what I'm calling the plain upset square corner. That is not official blacksmith terminology. I believe this is just called an upset square corner, but because we're throwing around the word upset in so many different ways here, I just wanted to, for the purpose of this presentation, try to make it as clear as possible. So this corner here in the middle is what I'm calling the plain upset square corner. It is where we bend the bar. Uh, and then with our hammer upset material into that corner. It has a square on the inside, square on the outside. This compares to uh, this corner I have up at the top, which has that dramatic radius, a gusset on the inside, and it's square on the outside. That corner has a lot more strength and it has some real visual impact. I've put down here at the bottom, a piece of bent bar. That's all this is. It's a piece of bent bar. And I think it's uh, very informative to look at this bar to see uh, what we're up against here. So when you bend a piece of bar, first of all, this was an eight inch piece of the size stock we need for the level two grill, the three eighths by three quarters inch bar. So this was eight inches long. So when I bend it, this center dimension is still eight inches long. So if I measured it right down the center, it's still eight inches. But if I measure it here on the inside, it's now shorter because we've bent the bar, we've compressed it on the inside. And as a result, we have material here that's been compressed. So if we looked at it from the other direction and you can just see it here, you can see that the material is now wider, thicker than three uh, quarters of an inch. Conversely, on the outside of this bar, we've stretched this dimension. It's now longer than eight inches. And as a result, we have less material up here. We've stretched it. So if we looked at it from the top, it's now skinnier than three quarters of an inch. Uh, so we need to somehow move this material that's down here up here uh, to create a square corner. Okay, one more note about all that, and Victoria is going to talk about measurements in her presentation, but this is just something to understand as you're working with corners. This bar here also started out as eight inches long. It is still eight inches in the center. So if we measured from right in the center of this corner to the end of the bar, it would be half of eight inches or four inches. It is four inches long. However, the outside dimension is now longer than what we started with. It is longer by half the thickness of the bar. So if I have kept my legs at the, the parent stock thickness here, three eighths of an inch, this outside dimension is now four and half of three eighths of an inch. So four and three sixteenths of an inch. Uh, so that's really important when you're thinking about where to place your corner. Um, if you don't want to add and subtract numbers, you can measure from that center line. But I'm going to leave that to Victoria because she's covering measurements in her next, but just to be aware of that and the dimensionality of what happens when you're creating that corner. Let's talk about what makes a good square corner. So first of all, it needs to be sharp and square on the outside. I think that goes without saying, that's the definition of what it is. For these plain square corners, we want it to be square on the inside or have a small radius. 
And I put a little asterisk there because this is not a big radius. It's not that gusset, not that dramatic gusset. It's a small radius. And so if you look at my samples over here, you can see that there is a small radius in there. And that is a feature of how we make the corner. When we make these, we're gonna make them open of 90 degrees and then close them up when we get close to having that, achieving that square corner. And the reason we're doing that, if you think back to that bent bar, we have more material here in the interior of our bend than we do on the outside. Remember that we have, we compress the material on the inside and we stretch the material on the outside. So as we create our square corner, the inside forms a square on the inside before we have enough material to form it on the outside. So to get around that, we go through the process of creating the corner open of 90 degrees and then close it up. And so if we've done that, we get a little tiny radius in there. And that's actually desirable because we don't want to crack. If we do it at exactly 90 degrees, and I have a picture of that later on, we will form, uh, basically the material will fold into itself and we've set up the situation where we could have a crack in that corner. Okay, next we want our corner in the desired location. In other words, if our center punch, we want the corner to be where our center punch is. Uh, we want to maintain parent stock dimension with no thinning. Okay, so this is half inch square bar here. You can see that we've maintained that half inch through the, through the leg into the corner and down the other leg. We don't want it to get thinner as we get into that corner. Uh, we want our legs to be straight with no undesired twists or bends. We want the corner itself to be free of cracks or cold shuts, and we want the legs and the corner to be free of any galling or tool marks from our vise or our anvil or any of the tools that we're using. Uh, we want our corner to be 90 degrees or uh, whatever um, dimension we want for our particular project. Okay, so materials and tools. For the level two grill, uh, the stock that we're uh, required to use is the three eighths of an inch by three quarters of an inch. Uh, if you have not made square corners before, I'm going to suggest that you start with something that's square, such as half inch square. It is easier to keep track of your dimensions if you're working with square. It is a little bit more difficult to do it with flat bar. Having said that, you can make square corners out of any shape bar. You can use round bar, you can use square bar, you can use flat bar. In fact, uh, using round bar is a good way to make a, a hold fast. You can make that square corner to add uh, stability to a hold fast. Okay, so you need a ruler or measuring device, a soapstone or silver pencil, a center punch. This is all to make that uh, center punch. Uh, you need a vise. You need some sort of tongs to hold your stock. Here I have the box jaw tongs for the um, flat bar, you need a scrolling wrench. The one that we made last month uh, is perfect for this. A light hammer. This is a maybe pound and a half hammer that works perfect. We want to upset material in that corner. We don't want our, our hammer blows to penetrate much beyond that corner. A framing square comes in handy uh, to make sure our corner is square. Okay, so we'll be working at the vise. If you don't have a vise, uh, you can do this entire process at the anvil. Um, if you do have a vise, there are some things that you should take into consideration. So what we're going to do is put our bar into our vise, bend it, and then start forging uh, that corner in the vise. Uh, so we want this to have rounded edges so that it's not cutting into our bar. Uh, we want our jaws to be clean and free of burrs, and we want our jaws to close evenly. So this vise up here is great. This one down here, you can see that the jaws don't close evenly. It's got some sharp edges, some other parts, uh, some funny business that look like they might mark the bar. So if you don't have a workable vise, consider using jaw covers or doing the entire process at your anvil. Okay, so our first set step is to set up the bend. Uh, so we want to center punch the location of the corner. Then we want to choose an appropriately sized scrolling wrench for the stock. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So these level two scrolling wrenches are perfect for this. Uh, we want to make sure that the scrolling wrench is larger than our stock. So for example, if we were working with half inch square bar, this is the half inch scrolling wrench that we made next month that's not going to give enough space to get our scrolling wrench into position. So for that half inch, we'd probably want to use three quarters of an inch. For the three eighths, you can just barely get away with that half inch. 
but the three quarters of an inch uh, maybe works better for that. Some other notes about the scrolling wrench, uh, you want to make sure that your edges are absolutely rounded so that you don't end up marking your bar as you do the bend. And then the other thing to watch out for is that your tines are absolutely parallel. If they're not parallel, you will introduce a twist into your bend uh, when you do that initial bend. Okay, so once you've picked out your scrolling wrench, you want to use the height of the scrolling wrench to determine where to position the bar and the wrench. So I have a photo of that here. So here we see the scrolling wrench in position. Uh, we measure from the bar to the top of the scrolling wrench um, and then write that number down. Okay, so once we have that number, we can use that height, the height of the scrolling wrench to position the bar in the vise. And this is so that we get the bend in the right spot. So we take uh, that height, position our center punch mark that distance away from your vise, and then your scrolling wrench in position that distance again away from your center punch mark. This will put your bend in the right spot. Once we've done that, we want to mark the vise. Okay, so you can see here, I, I mark the distance from the center punch mark uh, on each side. I put everything into position and then I mark the vise. Why am I doing that? When we take this out of the forge, we won't be able to see any of these marks. Uh, and you can see in this next photo, this gives us something to um, line up the bar quickly before we lose heat so we can get that bend done. So let's talk about the initial bend. So We've got everything in alignment. We've taken our bar out of the forge and we will watch a video of this in a second. We've taken our bar out of the forge. Uh, we want to use our scrolling wrench to, to bend the bar. What happens when we do that, we have a tendency, especially when we're bending away from us, of pushing down with our arm. So we want to avoid twisting the bar or pushing the bar down, bending it down during this bend. Uh, so to counteract that tendency, consider putting your scrolling wrench below the bar as you see it in this photo so that you can't push it down. It also gives you the ability to see uh, what's happening a little bit better. So if you are twisting or bending, you will see that happening because you're looking at it from above. Okay, bend away from you. So you can see in my feet in this photo, I'm bending away from me. Why am I doing that? It doesn't matter too much which way you bend, except that we want to, we'll have heat and we wanna go directly into forging um, this corner. And because we're trying to pull material into this corner with our hammer blow, we're upsetting it into the corner. We want to use the natural arc of our hammer swing. So coming forward, and then back towards our body is going to pull material into that corner. So we want to forge towards ourselves. Okay, if you remember only one thing from this presentation, it is this one. Bend to approximately 100 to 110 degrees. Don't bend all the way to 90 degrees. So here I have a photo here. Here's my square. You can see that I am open of that 90 degrees. It is not too critical exactly how open you are. You don't want it to be too open uh, because that gives you a little bit more work when you close it up, but 100, 110 degrees works great. And the reason for this is, again, we've compressed this material in here and when we forge it at 90 degrees, it will fold uh, into itself. So by having it open gives us the opportunity to get that material into the corner and then closing it up. Okay, so if you don't have a vise, bending over a well-rounded edge of your anvil is another option. So let's watch a video of this. And then this video is gonna start into the forging process and I'll talk through it in the video and then we'll talk through it in slides and then we'll watch some more video. Okay, so here we go. Now we put the bar into the vise, line it up with the, the, the marks, um, get the scrolling wrench, position the scrolling wrench uh, where, um, uh, it needs to go and then bend the bar and you can see here too shy of 90 degrees. This is about 100, maybe 110 degrees. Okay, at this point we can start forging. So we pull the bar out uh, and let me just stop it here so I can talk about that for a minute. So we pull the bar out. Why are we doing this? We don't want the vise, the jaws of the vise to cut into that corner where the bend is. So we don't wanna leave galling marks. So we pull that out uh, before we start hammering. Okay, at this point, what we want to do is find where the bar is flat, align our hammer with the angle of that flat, and then hammer 
to extend that flat towards the center punch mark. So I'll say that again, you find the flat of the bar, angle the hammer so it's in alignment with that flat, and then extend that flat to the center punch mark. You stop when you get to the center punch mark, don't go below this. So another way to say this is that you're taking out the bend with your hammer. So one more time, we're finding the flat, angling our hammer in alignment with the flat and then extending that flat until we get to that center punch mark, at which point we stop. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk through this in photos. Okay, so we position the bar so it's away from us. Uh, ensure the corner is sufficient distance from the vise to prevent galling. So again, if we look at this photo here, we can see that the jaws of the vise can cut into the corner if it's too close. So keep an eye on that. And then one thing that happens that you may notice in the video is that as the bar cools down and you're hammering on it, uh, it, it moves into the vise as the bar shrinks. Uh, so keep an eye on that and pull it out if necessary. Um, okay, so this you couldn't see in the video, and this is super critical. Grasp the leg of the bar, that's this bar that's sticking out of the vise, with a pair of tongs to prevent the corner from closing. Okay, so take your tong hand, get a pair of tongs that can hold on to the stock perpendicularly, and hold on to the end so that your, your angle doesn't close. As you're hammering on it, your angle wants to close. Um, and so um, you end up with two problems. One is that you're, you, you've lost your angle, but then when you try to open it up again, you risk uh, cracking that interior corner. So to, to prevent that, hold on to it with a pair of tongs to prevent that corner from closing. Okay, use light rapid blows with a light hammer. So you can see in this photo, this is not a heavy hammer. This is a light hammer. And the reason we're doing that is we're just trying to get material into this corner here. We don't want it to penetrate too deeply because um, then we're really foraging uh, further down than we want to. Okay, so the process, find the flat of the bar. So up here, you're finding the flat of the bar. Angle your hammer so it's in alignment with the flat. And then start to straighten the curve but don't go below the center punch mark. So essentially we're extending that flat until we get to the center punch mark. If you do that, if you keep your hammer in alignment with the flat of the bar, no matter what, you will end up with a square corner. Every problem I have seen is that the hammer is not in the right alignment. Uh, so here we have a photo of that. So we found the flat, we keep our hammer in alignment with that flat and we forge the flat until we get to the center punch mark right there. Okay, then at this point, we flip the bar to work on the other side. Um, in this case, we can't see the center punch mark anymore, although you could put one on there if you want. Uh, you can use the flat edge that we just created as a guide. So here's a photo of that. So this is the flat edge that we created on the other side. Uh, so then we flip to the other side, we find the flat of that bar, align our hammer, hammer it down, and then stop when we get to approximately the same spot on the other side. Okay, so let's watch a video of this. All right, so get that back into uh, the vise. We're holding it uh, with our, you can just see the hand up here, holding the other side with a pair of tongs. Find the flat of the bar and hammer that um, uh, flat, extend that flat to the corner. Um, I'll just pause that right here. You can see, so we did the other side uh, before. Uh, in that earlier part of the video. So you can see as you hammer this side, this starts to round again. So this is a process of two steps forward and one step back. And you'll need to flip over and hammer the flat again on the other side. Uh, so this is a process of going back and forth and um, you need to be patient with this. I think we're on the second or third heat here. By the end of this, I think we go through four or five heats uh, before um, achieving that corner. Uh, so keep that in mind as you work. So now we're doing this side for the second time. So this was the side um, that we did first. Again, you find the flat, hammer it with your hammer in alignment with the flat to the center punch mark. Never go below the center punch mark. Uh, okay, so that's the end of that video. All right. Okay, so we continue to work the corner until we get the, the square that we're looking for. And I will uh, throw this out here right now. This, 
there will be some part of this process where you think I am never going to get a square corner. This doesn't look square. It will never be square. Um, it's right about that point that all of a sudden it becomes square. Uh, so this really is a, uh, a, a repeat until you get uh, the desired result process. Uh, some tips to that. Be sure to keep the center line of your hammer above the inside edge of the other leg of the bar. So here's a photo of this here. Uh, so you can see that this is the, the uh, inside edge of the bar. This is the center line of the hammer. So, and the hammer's in alignment. So if you keep it there, you, you will prevent yourself from extending uh, the flat too far down. It'll also prevent you from, um, so something that commonly happens uh, is we want to follow this corner around as we go. Uh, so if you keep your hammer above this line, you keep yourself from that tendency. Okay, so upsetting will thicken the stock in the corner. Flatten this excess stock at the anvil as you work. Uh, okay, so what am I talking about here? So um, as, we're, as we're upsetting, our parent stock thickness uh, gets thicker, that three quarters of an inch. So we need to take it over to the anvil periodically and bring it back to parent stock thickness. Uh, this also helps get material into the area we need for the corner. Maintain a hundred degree angle throughout this entire process. Okay, so let's go back to that video. We're gonna pick up where we left off. Uh, and we're now doing this side for the second time. I think we're on our third heat here. And again, same process, find the flat, extend the flat until you get to the corner. Uh, and again, uh, you're holding that other side uh, with your tongue hand uh, and you're maintaining that 100 degree angle as you go. Um, so now this is the third time on this side. We're starting to see um, what I would call a corner. It's starting to square up on the inside and it's starting to square up on the outside. We're getting closer. So remember this was completely radius. It was just a radius bent bar when we started and we're starting to see a square corner here. You can see it thicken here. Uh, we will need to bring this over to the anvil to bring that back to three quarters of an inch. All right. So um, this needs to go back in the forge, uh, but I think we can pause it here to see. So you can see that this side is pretty much done here. Uh, this side needs a little bit more work over here, but we are getting pretty close to um, achieving that corner. Uh, so at this point, it's worth moving to the anvil. Um, and again, you can do this entire process at the anvil, there's pros and cons to working both the vise and the anvil. The convenience of the vise is that you have one leg captured in the vise so that uh, you can really concentrate on that corner. It allows you to see the angle of your hammer more easily. The benefit of the anvil is that you can move back and forth between hammering on one side and then the other side. So it's really useful as we get close to refining the corner, the, that final stages of making that corner. Uh, the drawback of the anvil is that because this leg is not constrained by the vise, we can end up bending that leg while we forge. Uh, so I'm going to talk through the um, process of forging square corners at the anvil, and then we'll watch a video of this. Uh, so first of all, take a yellow heat. This gives you time to quench. We need to quench this leg here. Uh, and the reason for that is because we're hammering from up here, the, the force of that blow is going to go wherever in our bar we have heat. So if we have heat down here, our bar will simply bend. And once it starts bending, we're no longer forging that corner. We're just bending the bar. So we really need to keep this leg quenched. All right. So at the anvil, there's two basic blows. There's the vertical blow, which is forging by hitting from above. We can see that in this photo here. This is a pretty powerful blow because we've got the hammer at the top and we have the anvil at the bottom. The second kind of blow is the horizontal blow. That's forging by hitting back towards your body. So here we have a photo of this here. Um, note that this is not against the edge of the anvil. We don't want to forge against the edge of the anvil. So this blow hitting back towards our body. Note that the vertical blow is stronger than the horizontal blow, so compensate accordingly. So for every two, three vertical blows, maybe you need uh, five, six horizontal blows. 
Okay, upsetting will thicken the stock at the corner, flatten as you work. So here's a photo of that. Uh, again, we wanna keep that at the parent stock three quarters of an inch thickness. Avoid forging on the corner of the anvil. There is a temptation. You're so close to that corner. You're just trying to get that part last bit square and you think oh, I'll do it at the edge of the anvil. This is the quickest way to thin your legs. Don't do it. Okay, if your legs bend or twist, correct before proceeding further. Okay, so what happens at the anvil is if there's any heat in your legs, they have a tendency to bend. Once it bends, uh, you're not forging that corner anymore. So take that bend out right away. And then bring to 90 degrees when the corner is nearly complete. So let's watch a video of this. Oh, here's uh, just the last photo of this is what we're aiming for is a nice square corner here. Okay, so here's the video of working at the handle. Uh, this is the, the horizontal blow coming back towards us. This is the vertical blow um, coming. And again, the, uh, the vertical blow is stronger. So you need more horizontal blows to compensate for that. And um, again, the benefit of working at the anvil is that you can move back and forth between the two sides. And this is really useful when you're getting to the point where you're refining uh, that uh, corner. Again, you can do the whole process at the anvil. Uh, the challenge if you do that is to, um, it's more difficult to see if your hammer is al in alignment with the flat of your bar. Uh, so if you are doing that and it's not working for you, maybe take a video of yourself forging to see if your hammer is really in alignment. Again, that alignment of your hammer is what gets that square corner. If your hammer is in alignment the whole time, you will achieve that corner. Okay, so let's talk about what can go wrong. This was a super interesting experiment to me. I forged this at exactly 90 degrees to see what would happen. And indeed the inside, I also used a slightly heavier hammer, um, the inside became square before I got square on the outside and started to fold together. So this is a big no-no and that's exactly why you want to forge open of 90 degrees. Okay, this is a mess. I would say the only good thing about this is my center punch mark is still in the center. So let's talk about what happened here. Uh, and I'll go through how to prevent and fix uh, most of these common problems. Okay, so overbending. So we just talked about why we don't wanna do that. Forging at 90 degrees will cause cracking. At the same time, opening up a corner that uh, started to close, once you started forging and if you open it up again, you run the risk of cracking there. So here's a sample of overbending. Um, I have another sample here. Um, so if your hammer's not in alignment, you can inadvertently create an overbending situation here. And then if you reopen that, you could cause cracking. So keep your initial bend to 100 to 110 degrees. Maintain that degree of bend as you work. Be sure to match the angle of your hammer to the angle of the bar. Use tongs to prevent the bend from closing. And then go to 90 degrees only when your corner is nearly complete. Okay, overforging. That was the problem or one of the problems I had in that upper photo. What do we mean by overforging? It means we um, we extended. So in, in one example is we extended the, the flat of the leg too far. So um, once we've extended that flat too far, you can't recover from that because we don't have enough material right here uh, to get it aligned. Also, you won't be in the center. You won't be where you wanted your corner to be. Again, don't forge past that center punch mark um, in terms of use a light hammer with light rapid blows in that uh, sample that I showed where I had uh, the inside had started to forge together. I was, I was purposely using a heavier hammer there and it does forge more in here than you want it to. Um, so some tips, sneak up on that corner uh, and work your sides evenly. Uh, and this is, especially at the anvil, sometimes you forget, which, you know, at the vise it's pretty easy because you're flipping from one side to the other, but at the anvil, sometimes you can't remember, did I just do that side or was I working that side? So try to keep an eye on that. Okay, so thinning. That photo I showed had some thinning problems as well. How do we prevent that? Um, so here we show a photo of the corner's been thinned, and this is a case of the what I was explaining, we have a tendency to wanna to follow that corner around as we go with our hammer. To kind of prevent that, uh, one thing we can do is to keep that center line of the hammer from going below the inside edge of the bar because then it makes it really hard for us to go down too far. 
also keep your hammer aligned with the angle of the leg. So if this hammer was in alignment with the angle of the leg, we wouldn't have this uh, problem right here. So again, avoid hammering past your center punch mark um, and absolutely don't hammer against the edge of your anvil because you will thin your legs if you do that. Okay, so galling or other undesired marks. Uh, this usually happens because there's something sharp like your vise, your anvil, or uh, your scrolling wrench have a, has a sharp edge. So ensure all your tools have rounded edges. When you're forging in the vise, position your bar sufficiently far from the jaws of the vise. If you are having trouble with your vise, quench the leg that's in the vise so it's hard and can't gall as easily. So something that happens sometimes is that, um, so as you're hammering and the, the bar is losing heat and you're hammering it, it's going into the vise and you end up with scratch marks on the inside. So quench, quenching that leg in that circumstance can be helpful. And again, avoid the temptation to square the corner against the edge of the anvil. Okay, so twists or bends. The most likely place to introduce a twist is in that initial bend where we either bend it down or twist it when we do that initial bend. So if you do that, correct your twist before proceeding further. Uh, you can take them out in the vise with a twisting wrench uh, to try to prevent them. Use a scrolling wrench from the bottom to prevent pushing downwards. At the anvil, uh, so if you're using the anvil, isolate heat to the corner with strategic quenching so we don't inadvertently end up bending the legs as we're trying to forge that corner. And again, at the anvil, you know, so if you're getting twisting while you're uh, forging at the anvil, it's usually something to do with the alignment of your hammer blows. So try to figure out what you're doing there uh, to correct the source of the problem, right? Um, you can correct the twist itself, but try to figure out what you're doing that um, is causing the twist in the first place. Okay, all right, so next we have the radius to upset square corner. And again, this is where we upset this first, create this uh, enough mass here to create this kind of dramatic radius or gusset on the inside and then this square corner on the outside. Okay, so let's take a look at the storyboard so we see where we're going here. What we're doing is we're upsetting in the area that will become our corner. We're then bending that. We need to use a slightly different technique here because we have so much mass right here. And then we move into familiar territory. So once we get it bent, uh, then we do the same thing. We align our angle of our hammer and create that flat. So you can see in this one, I've created that flat just on this side up to the, up to the center punch mark. And then I'll flip it around and do the other side. And eventually we end up with something that is square. Our first question is how much do we want? want to upset. Uh, and the rule of thumb is we want to upset 1.5 times the thickness of our bar. Okay, so since we're working with 3 eighths of an inch stock here uh, for our grill, I've done the math, 3 eighths of an inch times 1.5 is 9 sixteenths of an inch. This is my very simple visual, which is we know that just with a piece of uh, bent bar, we can create this square corner. Right, so what we need to add to that is this area here that I've outlined. Uh, so if I measure this, this is uh, 3 16 approximately 3 16 and you can see I need it to be about this long, right? So that gives me a lot of information, at least mentally for me, that works out with the 1.5 thickness math. Uh, so that makes sense to me. And it also tells me that I need a short uh, upset. And the rule of thumb that I've seen for that is to confine your upset to, again, that 1.5 times the thickness of your bar. Uh, and I drew that in here on this sample here. This is the 9 six, I think this is the 9 sixteenths here. And then this outer line is about three quarters. And I did that so that I could sort of get a visual when I was quenching. And if you do that, once you've shortened your bar by that 1.5 times the thickness, that's that 9 16 you will have 9 16 here. So you will have the correct amount of mass that you need to create this radius. Okay, so our first step is to upset the bar. I'm using a propane forge. I would need to quench anyways. I would love to have feedback from uh, some of you who have access to oxyacetylene and to uh, solid fuel to know uh, whether or not you need to quench. I'm guessing that you do because we need a really short um, heat here. Take a near welding heat so that you have time to quench. 
uh, strategically quench to isolate the heat to realistically, is it going to be 1.5 times the thickness? Maybe not, but close enough. Uh, what you don't want to have is for your, uh, for your heat to be too long. And we know when it comes to upsetting that once we get more than three times the thickness of the bar, you're going to just be bending the bar. You're not really upsetting it. For three eighths of an inch bar, that works out to just a little bit more than an inch. So if your heat is too long, you're going to be really struggling with bending instead of upsetting. So getting that heat as close as possible to uh, that shorter distance is helpful. The other thing is we don't really need our upset to be very long. We just need it to be in that corner. If it's too long, then we need to take it out of the leg. So having a short heat is helpful. Okay, so keep the center punch mark in the center as you work. That maybe goes without saying, but it is a little bit of a juggle to try to get the, uh, to quench this, to keep the heat around that center punch mark, uh, because we do want that upset to go in that corner. In terms of upsetting, I upset at the anvil. For the level two grill, the bar is longer. Maybe you want to use something that's lower down if you have some sort of solid mass that you can put below the height of your anvil that might be helpful. Watch for bends. So it has a tendency to want to bend right here. And you have this big mass, it wants to bend there. Take that out right away. Cause again, once you have a bend, uh, you're not upsetting anymore, you're just bending. Uh, so immediately correct bends and or recenter the upset on the bar over the hardy hole. So I have a photo of that. Uh, you don't want to mess up the part or take out the upset you've just put in so you can recenter that over your hardy hole. Dress the width back to parent stock width. So we uh, we want our upset on the three eighths of an inch dimension. We don't want it on that three quarters of an inch. So bring that three quarters of an inch back to three quarters of an inch and uh, reduce the length of your bar by 1.5 times your thickness. And then you should end up with that nine sixteenth uh, here dimension. Uh, expect this to require multiple heats. Uh, I am using a propane forge, so my quenching, I'm losing a lot of heat when I'm doing that, but I could not do it faster than four heats. I'd be curious uh, how it works out for the rest of you. Okay, so bending the corner. So we need to use a different technique here than we did before. If we used our scrolling wrench, it would bend not where we have mass, but where it gets skinny here in the legs. Uh, so we need to bend it a different way. So here we're bending it over the horn. Again, we need to do some strategic quenching to isolate the heat as necessary. You want to keep this part cold so that when you're bending here, it doesn't just bend right in here. You want to be sure to position your hammer to bend the upset and not the leg. So what do I mean by that? If we hammered it down here, it's just going to, again, it's just going to bend at the path of least resistance right there. So we need to position our hammer so that we're hammering into uh, where that upset mass is. Be careful not to forge down the radius or thin the legs. Okay, so just like bending a scroll, we want to bend over air. You can see I've got air here. At some point, we're gonna be um, getting close to the, the horn. We want to be careful not to take out that upset we just put in. Uh, keep the center punch center in the center. I don't think you can see mine, I think it's on the other side, but keep your center punch mark uh, in the center. So create the corner. So now we're getting into familiar territory. This is exactly the same process that we did before. So I'm showing it here at the anvil strategically quench to isolate your heat as necessary. So here I've strategically quenched this so it doesn't bend as I'm forging up here. I'm drawing that, um, I'm extending that flat to the corner. You can work at the horn on the face of the anvil or in the vise. I find it easiest to work on the anvil for this one. And I would make the recommendation that you master the other corner before you try this one. This extra mass makes it much more difficult to try to uh, forge this corner. I found it is possible to do in the vise. Because there's so much material here, you run the risk of galling. So I did find it easiest to do this at the anvil. It can be helpful to brace the leg against the step of the anvil or a hardy block. So here I've showed it uh, braced against the step of my anvil. You can also use a hardy block for that. What am I talking about here? So as we hit here, our corner wants to open up. Bracing it against the step and also holding it with the tongs uh, prevents that from happening. 
If it does open, if your corner opens, you can reclose it over the horn using the method I just showed you. Keep your punch mark aligned to the diagonal. We want the corner to be in the center. Okay, the inside will not have a smooth radius until the outside corner is almost complete. What do I mean by that? It will look funny until it's done. And then all of a sudden it will have this beautiful smooth interior radius and a square corner on the outside. And that's our goal. Our goal is a smooth interior radius and a sharp square exterior edge. Uh, so that is what I have for corners.